What's going on, everyone? Welcome to Can I Kick FC. I'm your host, as always, Elliot Barr, and I just want to say thank you for taking the time of your day for listening to another episode of Black History, you know, Black Soccer History. Um, while, before we get started, make sure you like, share, and subscribe um, on your favorite podcast host and on YouTube. And joining me on today is a guy that has been covering NWSL in depth, um, who has covered the league through its, its very hiccups. <laughs> um, who's a proud spirit cover? I don't know how to say that. <laughs> That's not all weird. Um, and who probably has the same frustration of me with 95. It is Mr. Andre Carla. How are you doing, sir? Oh, I'm good. And yeah, you ain't lying. I just had, I, I normally work remote, but for work, they've been like, you know, ho- holiday stuff, like coming to the office, we're going to have some meetings. And I'm like, hey, man. <laughs> I, don't, I don't like this commute life i know a lot of people got to do it but i've been remote for years and uh whew, it's a struggle so yeah that 95 part correct yeah man i don't i don't know what part of 95 you live on but i'm like oh obviously i'm the rich man and the part that frustrates me is the most is anything past stafford going so, to like quantico like that that just utterly frustrates me because <laughs> okay, i know it's so, an accident my not not to put all my business out there, but um, I live in Silver Spring. I work in Old Town Alexandria, so that's the part I'm talking about. <laughs> it's the worst part. Yeah, it's not fun. It's not fun at all. <laughs> yeah, man. I, uh, I I wish you the best for uh, <laughs> like one accident. You might as well just cancel all your plans. Oh, right. Yeah, exactly. And, and it's tough too because you'll be driving and. It doesn't really matter what the GPS says because, like, the GPS, like, I basically just have it on. Like, I know where to go, but I, I have it on just to, like, tell me, like, what are – set my expectations. Like, when am I yeah. actually going to get home? But then every now and then you'll see it just creep up for no reason. It'll just creep up. Like, it's like you're supposed to get home at, like, 630, and then all of a sudden it'll be like, nope, 648. And now it's, like, 7 o'clock, and you're like, what happened? It's, <laughs> it's like, never, like, quit. small increments. It's never, like, th- <laughs> right. it's never, like five. It's, like – 30 minutes yeah 45 and it's right like, oh god yeah i yeah i it's it's not fun and every time i'm like they're always like do you want to take a shorter route don't fall for it no, <laughs> unless you've been there before don't fall for it yeah don't fall for it do not, <laughs> do not do it at all um let's talk about man i mean obviously before we get started on everything um we had some news drop today jill ellis who um correct me if I'm wrong she was the president of san diego wave yes yeah, she just got a new job. I'm, I'm dubbing this the Arsene Wenger role because mm-hmm. that's pretty much what it feels like. Yep. Um, what are your thoughts on that before we get started with everything? I mean, I, I think it's – the Jill Ellis conversation is a long conversation. So yeah. I'll kind of sum it up with, like, I, I think that a lot of people are aware of Jill Ellis from her back-to-back World Cup wins, 2015-2019. Mm-hmm. Um, that gave her a lot of grace uh, with the team and or just in the sport in general the problem is that she has been called out a, num- a number of times by former players uh Sydney LaRue is one former player who just straight up said quote she's not good for people's mental health <laughs> like that was just a straight up direct quote that she said uh and we found out at San Diego that there were multiple lawsuits that referred to Ellis that named Ellis but were really targeted at the NWSL for not doing their job and also the San Diego Wave for not doing their job um, and kind of protecting the work environment. So there are accusations of a toxic work environment, some really, you know, unfortunate gross stuff too, in terms of like employee to employee that was kind of swept under the rug if according to these uh, lawsuits. So I encourage people to check those out, uh, read the defector pieces. Leslie Ryder has been doing a really good job reporting on that along with Diana Moskovitz. And it's just not a good look. And so FIFA kind of saw all that and was like, that's the kind of toxicity we need. Let's bring that over here. And um, it's just kind of like perfect for the way FIFA operates. So while I'm glad she's out of the NWSL and out of San Diego, because it sounded like she caused a lot of issues, or at least if she didn't cause them, she was, wasn't part of a solution uh, intentionally, it seems. And if that's the case, then I'm glad she's gone, but also working at FIFA, failing up, all that kind of stuff. It's not great. Yeah, no. It's, it's not it's not it's not a good look at all for anyone at all. But yeah, I definitely want to get your thoughts on that because it was just so funny that the day that we talk about NWSL, this news drop. So yeah. Who, who better to talk about? But let's 
<laughs> Let's go to happier times. Let's talk about NWSL as a whole because I feel like this season has been one of this one of those years where the NWSL really got to shine. You know, like yep. there wasn't a lot of off the field noise in a negative way that detracted from what happened on the field. And just looking back through the season, this is probably like a holistic view. I don't know if you even had a chance to even do this yet, but like, what are maybe your top? three or five highlights of the season so far mm. highlights is a fun one because I, I think you get to talk about a number of 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 teams and a number of things that happen i mean obviously and we'll talk about them later on so i'll just mention them off the top but orlando pride like the the season they had i think needs to be contextualized and we'll do that throughout the course of this but yeah. like they had the best season in nwsl history uh, and that's outrageous. So that was amazing. Kansas City Current were kind of amazing. After starting off with a really troublesome offseason, um, the way that they played, Tim Wachowenga hitting the league and, and breaking the scoring record in her first season, which is just something that doesn't happen in the NWSL, was incredible. Um, I mean, I, I'm focusing on the top four because it's kind of hard not to, but like the spirit, we're not supposed to be what they were uh, this season at all. I mean, this was after last season, you know, they had Mark Parsons, they got rid of him and they're bringing in a coach who's accomplished, but he's not coming in until mid season and all of that. And they were one of the strongest teams at the end, made it all the way to the championship game. Like I, I think there were a ton of highlights and surprises. Um, and then of course, individual performances too. So like it, you asked me that question, I feel like I could talk for like about 20, 30, 600 more minutes, but let's I'm go ahead it. and do it, man. Let's <laughs> go ahead and do it. Look, that was the question. Let's go ahead. Let's get into it about like, <laughs> obviously everyone know about Barbara Banda, um, yeah. you know, a whole list of them, S Sophie, a whole list of them. Who are the standout players in the that people might not be aware of? Because it's easy to go to like, Oh, these are all the forwards. These are the ones you need to worry about. Who are the ones that people don't know about that really had an impact on the season that really blossomed over the year? Yeah, quite a few. I mean, back to Orlando, I think Emily Sams was a great defender. I think her partnership with Kylie Strom, who Kylie Strom started out playing as fullback and shifted inside, and that was incredible. They had a really good partnership, and we're like – they're the reason why the Pride won the championship. The Spirit were on them, and their ability to defend in the box was in incredible. Um, I'm also thinking about Yasmeen Ryan. We saw her now with the national team. Her development has been great at Gotham. Uh, she's just been able to be so versatile, play out wide, come inside, kind of play that chaotic <laughs> style that uh, <laughs> the Gotham coach wants them to play. So she's she's been exceptional. I think Vanessa DiBernardo as well at um, uh, Kansas City. To me, she was on her like short on the short list of for MVP for until she went through some injury troubles. But her passing, her vision, her ability to like connect with with her forwards in midfield uh, and be that linchpin in midfield was really, really excellent. She was so good. She had a ton of assists early in the season as well. Like she was all over the place. She was excellent. And I think we had some really good defensive performances, too. I think Alyssa Mallinson was a standout it's a rookie player but you know for bay fc she had a great game against trinity rodman in the playoffs i think she was excellent i think abby Dahlkemper, when she got her move to bay fc she was probably like defender of the year caliber if she'd have made that move earlier she would have been in the mix for defender of the year so like yeah there's been a ton of them and i ain't even mentioned the forward who turned into a center back so <laughs> yeah i remember hearing about that did she did she play for uh the spirit yep, yep. okay Yep. Yeah, I need, I need to hear this story because I was, matter of fact, I was actually listening to y'all podcast before. I think y'all were doing y'all preview about the final. Mm -hmm. You were talking about like, yeah, we just messed around and found out that, you know, she's a great center back. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it, it, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, basically, I think it was the, I think it was the off season of, of the, the, after the 2022 season. And she'd been a forward. She played for the spirit as a forward. She wasn't super dynamic as a forward, but she was strong, you know, capable of getting in the box and and doing some things, you know, uh, scoring a few goals. She played at USC uh, as a forward. So a really good program, college program, uh, played alongside some really good players as well, like Croy Bethune, uh, who is just unreal. But um, that offseason, they kind of just went to her and were like, hey, we're thinking about switching your position to center back and at first he's kind of like are you joking like is this some sort of end of the season like like are, are the coaches just messing with me 
And they were like, no, nah, we want you to kind of think about it and see. And she did it and she straight up owned it. Like I, telling a forward they're going to play center back, that just mindset wise, that doesn't jive. But she was like, all right, I'm going to give this my best shot. If they think this is the best shot, they see qualities in my game that think this would work. Let me just see. And she said it was weird, obviously. Uh, and she didn't really feel like a center back until like this year. She was like, yeah, I'm a center back. But she still wears the number nine. And it's great. <laughs> that is, that has to be the most awkward conversation for someone who right? doesn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just in and <laughs> I, and the, the thing that makes her so impressive as a defender is that if you look at like the 1v1 stats for her, she is like top three or four in the league among all center backs. And she does not get beat 1v1. Wow. If you get if you allow her like to get close to her, like we'll talk about Barbara Banda, too. But Banda always goes to the other spirit center back. She, <laughs> she struggles with that one because she's so strong and she still has that footwork, that foot speed to keep up that it's really hard to get by her one V one. She likes when players get close to her because she's strong enough to kind of manipulate them and anticipate their movements and eventually move them away from good areas or move them off the ball altogether. And so like, it's, it's been brilliant and it's been one of the wildest things to just be true about watching the spirit is that a former forward is their best center back. She played every single minute this season. I would have to imagine she's probably one of the better ball carrying center backs in the league you know what's I funny? Have to imagine that. you know what's funny like she has good like average like dribble and carry numbers when i kind of look at them yeah. they're not the best i think there's still a way for her to develop in terms of her forward passing i mean it's a completely different perspective on the pitch too but her carry numbers are are solid but it's mainly her straight up in a duel, when she engages in a duel, she rarely loses them. I think the the percentage is something like 85% uh, wins in her duels. It's outrageous. Wow. That, yeah, that, that's outrageous. That's, a, that's so weird. <laughs> it's extremely I'm strange. Just to, I'm just trying to like, just, just imagine that. Oh, um, so we're talking about like a striker becoming a center back and all this other stuff, but like, mm -hmm. As we look throughout the whole league, um, what how impressed were you about some of the tournament? Like you mentioned, like the Spurrier wasn't supposed to even be in this position. It was supposed to be a quote unquote rebuild here. Mm -hmm. Were there any other teams that impressed you with their rebuild or any teams that you were disappointed in they were supposed to be better? Because I, oh. I, I thought the wave was gonna be a lot better than what they were. Well, they they should have been, uh, and then they made silly decisions in the front office, which, again, another shout-out to Jill Ellis. Um, but Casey Stoney getting let go was really yeah. unfortunate. Um, she the, the, Like, the way we're not having a good season, but Casey Stoney has proven that she can build teams from scratch and be successful with them. She did yeah. it with Manchester United, who wasn't even in uh, the top league. They had to, like, fight their way for promotion to get there. Um, cause they only started a women's team in 2018 and she did the same thing with San Diego. They made the playoffs in their first year and they went through a bad spell and immediately she's out. And I don't think that was really a fair firing. She didn't think it was all that fair either. Uh, so yeah, that, that was frustrating. So I, I see it from San Diego. They were a super talented team, but obviously like that. And then Alex Morgan suddenly retiring was like, Whoa, okay. So that changes your season a little bit. Yeah. Um, I think Bay FC, they spent a ton of money and they brought in some really good players and they just were trying to play super expansive. Like we're just going to, you know, stretch the pitch, keep the ball, play this really intricate possession game. And in the NWSL, nah, man, <laughs> you, you gotta, if you're going to do that, you, you need, you need some, you need like the best at each position to be able to do that. And it's hard. And they had some of the best, like Kundanaji was great, but it, they had to change their style of play. And once they did, they were a very dangerous team, but people thought they were going to be a bit better than they were. And Angel City also a little bit disappointing. You expected to see kind of a step up. That team is talented. Uh, wanted to see them kind of put some things together and they really weren't able to do it. So, you know, I, I think there are a lot of teams who struggle. I could even mention Seattle Reign. They were in a championship yeah. a year ago, and they had a bad one. So finished 13th out of 14th this season. Yeah, that's tough. I, I mean, yeah. 
before I go into my next, I, I want to stick on this point about it. Like, why is it that some of these teams, because it felt like in the result versus other leagues, like a team can be, it changes so much year in, year out. Yeah. Where like a team can be really, 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 is that just because of how rosters are being constructed or continuity or the it's, influx of the women's game? Yeah, it's it's a lot of factors. And I think the biggest one is that a lot of these, a lot of these team owners and a lot of these front offices aren't used to have, aren't used to, to being forced to be serious. <laughs> um, you have to like, now the game isn't just, you can do enough to get by. Like you have to be on your game. You have to get in the right coach. You have to set the right culture. You have to do your player recruitment, your player scouting, your player analysis. You need data as part of it. Like you, you have to have a professional setup. You can't just rely on a dude you know. And that's kind of like old school NWSL, where it's just like, which is how a lot of the bad shit happened in the league. Like it was just like this person has all the power and they're able to kind of control everything. And that's bad. But also, it's not conducive to actually building a quality soccer team. Yeah. And when you have now a lot of teams doing that, um, and there were some things like that wasn't totally Seattle's fault. Uh, there were like a delay in their team being sold that kind of was a problem for them. They weren't able to make moves and spend the kind of money that you need to spend in an offseason. But um, I, I think mostly when you see this kind of fluctuation, it's basically like who wants to finally be serious? And when somebody's serious, you can see it, and then you see the result. So Gotham did it a year ago, and they won the championship last year. You're just kind of like, oh, okay, they got really serious about their business. Uh, and the Spirit did it this year. Kansas City did it this year. Orlando did it. And, yeah, those are your top four teams. So it, to me, it's just about you have to have the standard of what's required in your front office on down is raised, and some teams are there. And some teams aren't quite yet. And we definitely see it with like NWSL becoming a lot more international. Like we saw what yeah. Barcelona's, Barcelona's head coach mm -hmm. coming from uh, arguably probably the greatest team season in women's sports. Um, coming here, you saw Barbara Brand, the other players, whatnot. Yep. How is NWSL getting to this point where they can, they're being a juggernaut in the international game? Because and I know we don't want to do too many comparisons of the men's game, but I think this is, to me, I think this is a fair point of, like, in MLS, for instance, like, Pep Guardiola is not leaving Man City to come <laughs> here. You know, right. like, yeah. Erling Holland is like, you know what? I think I want to go play for Houston. You know? Like, <laughs> that would be hilarious. <laughs> know, right. But you don't see that happening. Right. So, like, what is it about? Is it, and I hope I'm not being too general or, or, laying over but it's just because like end of is just stable like play, play, you know you're gonna get a check is that just a big part uh, of it for some leagues yeah uh so some teams i won't even say leagues but some teams yeah, yeah. i mean, I, I do think that that's important and you do want to be taken seriously as a professional athlete and there are still some clubs in europe that as much as that's like positions himself as like the 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 bastion of, of football sometimes when it comes to the women's game a lot of teams still don't really give a shit uh and so that's a problem uh and you have players who would prefer if their careers were respected <laughs> um and uh, and you have a, a league like the nwsl that is growing and showing that kind of seriousness so i i think it's a number of things the one thing that like if you are comparing directly nwsl versus like mls mm -hmm. is the NWSL has a major leg up because you can get a ton of U.S. players on the team, yeah. on, 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 in the league, and they're going to be some of the best players in the world. It's not necessarily the case in the MLS. So you do have a, a league that already has an opportunity to be one of the most talented in the world, and you add in the fact that the, that the NWSL is like just hyper-competitive. And a lot of women athletes are like, they crave that. They want that competitive. They, they want that like really tough league. This is why a lot of, a lot of players who come from internationally, they, they are drawn to the NWSL because every week's a scrap. Like every week is a battle. And that, that is something that professional athletes love. You kind of get that high every single week of, of either you won and you can like you feel accomplished or you didn't and you can get better. 
or even you won and you can get better, like all of that stuff. And I think that really resonates with a lot of the players around the world. And then the more the, the NWSL teams keep building up their front offices, staffing their, their teams, giving them the resources to be successful, the more you're going to see a lot more international talent be lured to the NWSL, which is also great um, because I think we're also in a golden era of U.S. Women's National Team talent, too. So I, I think the NWSL is in a great place. And uh, that is why, like, the in internationally, it is getting recognized quite a bit. Yeah. I mean, God, that's good to see. Like, it's good to see, like, yeah. the NWSL is being, once again, like, the juggernaut in the national stage and whatnot because, like, I, I was really shocked when I saw Barcelona manage to leave. And I was like, Wait, what? He's going <laughs> to DC? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, that caught me off guard. I mean, Casey Stone, they're like, all right, cool. I get it. Maybe mm -hmm. she felt like her time was up. But to pull that one and to get, like, players like Barbara Brand and others mm -hmm. here, I mean, these are guys, players that we've seen on the international stage at the World Cup, and then they're making a the move over here. How how big – and I mean, granted, we have another World Cup coming up soon. Mm -hmm. How big was that World Cup in Australia and New Zealand for the NWSL and being like, hey, like you can come here, you can get the same level of competition week in, week out? You know what's funny is I don't know if it – I mean, I obviously it was big because whenever women's soccer is like – gets a chance to be on the main stage, it's good. that's important uh, yeah. for all the leagues around the world. But given how poorly the U.S. women's national team played and like their results – I don't know how big of an impact it had um, because basically what, what the NWSL had, unfortunately, was like in 2019 when the team won there, I think all but like one or two players on that team that won the 2019 World Cup played in the NWSL. So mm -hmm. that was like the time they had just done the, the equal pay lawsuit. They were one of the like they won in such dramatic fashion every single game. They basically ran through all of Europe to, to win. It was like ridiculous, the run that they went on. And it was great. And then the whole COVID thing happened. And yeah. that completely like stops all that momentum. So I think like the World Cup helped put it back on the map. But the performance at the World Cup didn't do a ton. Uh, but I do think that it seems like NWSL. Some NWSL offices, like front offices and all that, were smart about kind of making contacts, going like being at the World Cup, like doing player research, things like that, mm -hmm. to try to see like, hey, maybe this is a player that we can bring over um, and showing some level of ambition. So I, I think it's hard, especially because that World Cup was so far away. It was hard to like translate the energy directly. And when the, yeah. the U.S. Women's National Team has poor results, that's also tough. But just being in the spotlight made it like, OK, you get to still watch some of the best women's soccer players in the world. And the NWSL now has a chance to kind of pick up what it, where it kind of left off when the pandemic kind of shut everything down. OK, OK. So that's a good way to put on it. Um, so we're going to pivot a little bit. And I want to talk about a team that I think I've heard you guys have, quote unquote, dubbed them as the bridesmaid of NWSL for the longest, Orlando Pride. <laughs> they finally got over the hump. They want they go on this historic run during the season. They win the league title. They win the players' hill. Like this team has shown a lot of growth. Like how yeah. do you how do you assess the team's overall performance of the year? Like when you go back and look over this season, one is it the greatest team in NWSL history? And then two, like how special. And unique will this team be when you go back and look at the overall arching history of the league? Yeah, that's a that's an interesting one. Just because I hope we're in a phase where we get to see more teams kind of follow the model, and so hopefully they're not such an anomaly in the future. But given all the historical context that we have right now, mm -hmm. I I think they're the best team that the NWSL has ever had. I think they have. Obviously, you can say like they won more games than any team, but this was also the, an NWSL season with the most games it's ever had. There are 26 games this NWSL season, and so that factors in. But I even think points per game were higher if you average that out, and that's a way to kind of flatten the measurement. Uh, yeah. That's even better than some of those dynast dynastic North Carolina Courage teams. But here's the thing about those North Carolina Courage teams. They had Crystal Dunn, 
They had Sam Mewis. They had Lynn Williams. They had Dabinia. Like that team was absolutely loaded uh, and, and was very, very good. But I still think, especially defensively, Orlando as a total team was outrageous in kind of yeah. all phases. And to me, I think they went what? I think they went. They kept a clean sheet in half of their games. So 13 out of 26 games, they kept a clean sheet. Um, and I think they went without losing until like, I think it was the 22nd or 23rd game of the season or something like that. They basically clinched the shield, partied, and then lost the game, their first game, which you kind of give them like respect. Like you, you earned that. That's fine. Yeah. Uh, so they went on like a tiny baby slump, but then of course picked it back up, went through the playoffs, scored a bunch of goals. And won the and won the championship. So yeah, to me, and and only one other team has done that before. One other club has ever won the shield and the championship in the same season. And Orlando just uh, became the second one to do it. And so like yeah, I, this season was outrageous from them. Wow, wow. Um, <clears throat> so like, what moments about this team stand out to you the most? Like, Ooh. what are the moments that stand out to you the most that define the season? Hmm. No, oh, the define the season. Um, yeah. cause okay, so I think the moment that defined their season was you know, because every team, like you mentioned it, like Orlando Pride was not a good team. Like historically, I wouldn't even say like not a bridesmaid, like they weren't even invited to the wedding. Like they, <laughs> like they they were not good. They were always at the bottom of the table for the most part. They had like one year where they spiked, but they were always trying to bring in great talent. You know, they had Alex Morgan and obviously March has been with the team forever, but they kept bringing in players, but it was never working because again, you can't just do the basic stuff. Like everything has to kind of work together. Um, mm. And they finally took it seriously. And so they brought in a GM and Haley Carter, who if you, you like, I, I encourage people to kind of look her up because her story is wild. Uh, if you remember, there was a story with like the Afghanistan women's team and trying to, like she was she was the coach of that team. Like she was helping that team out. She is a, a really interesting person and a really dope person. So when she agreed to do this, it was like that's one of the most serious people that you can put in this position. And so they started to be serious. Um, but in terms of this season, where things started to turn, like where they started to actually believe that they could accomplish the things they wanted to accomplish, I think was in their first meeting with Kansas City Current. Because for the majority of the season, especially the ha the first half of the season, they were battling one and two for the top spot. Like Orlando was at, at the top, but it was always like, do people really believe the Orlando pride? Like all that history is there. <laughs> like not not nothing against this team, but are we really going to believe that Orlando pride is actually this good? And then Kansas City comes, they're flying. They're scoring a ton of goals every single game and they just look unstoppable. Like nobody can defend them. They meet. Uh, it was right before the break for the Olympics. And I think they they both, like their star players, Banda and Chawenga, I think traded goals early in the in the yeah. first half. And then Chawenga draws a foul on Kerry Lawrence, who plays for Orlando Pride. And the Pride go down a player. It was a red card. It was their second yellow, and it was a, it's a red. So they go down to 10. They scrap, they scrap, they scrap. Second half, they scrap. They win a penalty, score the penalty, end up winning the game two to one. It really pissed off Kansas City <laughs> because they were really upset about that. They took that loss really hard. But I think that was the thing that let them know that it doesn't matter what situation we're in. We can be against the best attacking team that NWSL has ever seen, which Kansas City current were, and we can shut them down. And we can continue to, to threaten in smart ways and win a game in a different way than what we're used to. And they did. And I think that belief from that game was huge. Marta celebrated that game like it was a championship, uh, <laughs> which is another thing that Kansas City didn't appreciate. But I think it, that that was the game that really like sold them on. We have these really lofty goals, but they're not actually lofty because we are actually that good. Yeah. Uh, talking about Orlando, like you got already mentioned it, but like what what was the whole turnaround in this for them? Like what? What made them into what they are now? Because you mentioned, like, they, they brought in a new head coach and yeah. they finally seemed to get the chemistry straight the team. But was it just as simple as, like, you fix these couple of things and it just changed the culture? Like, what 
what changed the culture for him until 180 to becoming this? Yeah, no, I mean, it had to be a lot of things. So it, it was like set, ch changing the culture was a, a massive part of it. Um, I think they had to be deliberate about it. They had to get the right people in, involved who were going to do that. I mentioned GM Haley Carter. You mentioned the coach, Seb Hines. Like they were very, very into trying to change the culture of like togetherness. You play together. You know, the team has to be one kind of pulling in the same direction, cover for one another. Um, then, of course, a good game plan, but also bringing in different qualities of players and spotlighting them, putting them in right positions to actually specialize on the pitch and make it make their individual talents be part of an entire collective. So it took a lot of that. Of course, the internal belief of like, we're not just the Orlando Pride anymore. Like we like forget all the history of that. Like we're this team. This is a different team. This is something different. You don't have to be connected to all that history. So, like, it was important to get people in that were going to drive that message home. How they did it day to day, I don't know, because I feel like you can say that once, but you can't say it every day. Yeah. Because that's just going to yeah. be like, all right, chill out. But, like, it's it was that. And then it was making smart decisions to show how serious they were. So, you know, they brought in a ton of other players like Adriana, who I think was an MVP candidate last season. Um, Orlando just missed the playoffs last season by one goal. It was just goal differential. And the team that got in over them was Gotham, who won the whole thing. <laughs> so, like, wow. that's that was that was the kind of step that you could kind of see them slowly, like, Orlando slowly getting to. Uh, they made really good draft picks. Emily Sams was a great draft pick. But also other players like Corey Dyke, like Summer Yates, these players that weren't necessarily top line, like top ten picks, but were really talented and going to do a really good job if you give them the right structure and opportunity, which they were really good at. So I think they did that. And then, of course, the big one, they recruit Barbara Banda. Barbara yeah. Banda could have gone anywhere. Her Can we talk about her? Like, because she yeah. is electric. Like, Oh, my God. She's yeah. the kind of player where, and I will say this, I am not, I'm not the biggest NWSL fan. Like, mm -hmm. I, I watch the league overall. Like, I don't mm -hmm. have a team. But that for her, like she's yeah. on like that Steph Curry, like I she's an appointment television. Yes, yeah, I, that's a great way to put it. Like my thing, the thing with Barbara Banda is, and this is why I love watching the women's game because I think that a lot of people try and find like the male equivalent to certain players because it yeah. just makes it easier for them in their brains. There is no male equivalent no. To, to Barbara no. Banda. Like she's... what she does on, I think the most impressive thing for her is like. It's not even the on the ball movement, it's yeah. the off the ball movement. Because yeah. it's like she's literally out there like four moves ahead. Yeah. Like I, I never think I think it was the semifinal. And she was on the left wing and she made like this move where she doubles the ball to her, but then like she cuts inside yeah. and it takes out like three defenders. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, yeah. yo, what? <laughs> like that's insane. Yeah. Yeah. She she's she's that ridiculous. I mean, I the thing that I love about Barbara Banda is that she can be in attack whatever the Orlando Pride need her to be. So you need her to like run and stretch a defense. She can be that get behind the line kind of striker. You need her to pull wide and play through the channels. She can do that too. She can even face players up 1v1 wide areas and get her shot off or get an assist off. You need her to drop deeper and kind of play as a target player. She can do that, too. She's strong enough to hold up the ball. She's aware enough of all her teammates. She plays really well off of another uh, attacking midfielder or another attacker. If you need to just be a poacher in the box, she can do that, too. There's really no defense for her because any in any sequence, she can play any one of those roles or multiple. And so the thing I love about watching Barbara Banda is that she'll figure out eventually what is the thing that is most likely to get me a goal against this defense. Are they really good at playing me physically? Do I need to beat them with my speed? Or are they, can I handle them physically? Or like you've mentioned a, a couple moves, can I kind of trick them and find myself some space in the box or around the box to be able to score or set up my teammates? She'll do whatever is necessary. And she's so smart and she's so active on the pitch that she'll figure it, she'll keep going until she figures it out. And she pretty much always figures it out. Like her, she's just one of those players who is genuinely, we, we kind of clown, we say this a lot in women's soccer is that a player is inevitable. Um, she's the most inevitable player I've ever well, seen. She is. She yeah. is inevitable. Like, yeah. 
she she is the kind of person where regardless of the score, and I think there's only like a few players like regardless of sport, regardless of game, but regard regardless of the score, mm-hmm. regardless of what's happening in the match, when she's on, yeah. it's going to go in her favor. Like it's, <laughs> yeah. it's it, like you said, it's inevitable. That's how great she is. Yeah, it's it's wild to watch. Um, it's been wild to watch to see like the different defensive approaches that other teams have tried to go against her and all of that. And you can find some success, but ultimately, she as long as she's on the pitch, she's gonna find a way to be influential in the game and, and contribute a goal in some sort of way. And yeah. it's great to watch. Like it's it's fun, especially because she also can do the outrageous stuff. Yeah, like she a defender inside out like on the ball with her dribble she can hit a powerful shot uh she can score a banger header like she can do all of the finishing stuff but she adds in all of the other stuff that makes her so well-rounded and impossible to cope with let me ask you this though like and i don't know but i'm gonna throw this out there okay has she done enough to be ball on door winner oh i mean <laughs> The problem with the Ballon d'Or for me is that I I think their calendar is a problem uh, for yeah. a lot of players who play in the U.S. Because um, yeah. I think Naomi Gurma should have obviously been on the list. Um, but, yeah, <laughs> I think she can. She should in her career at some point. And I definitely think what she's done this year with the, with the Orlando Pride and what I expect her to do when next season starts, the only thing you might have – some sort of gripe about is her international career, like her, her national team career, because Zambia is not their talented team, but there's a lot of issues, which we won't get into, but there's a lot of issues with that team. But when she plays, she also has a habit of scoring hat tricks at the Olympics. I think she has three hat tricks in like five Olympic games, five or six Olympic games. Jeez. So like if she continues to do that on an international level and she continues to do what she's doing at the Orlando Pride, she needs to be on the short list, and I would just I, I would go ahead and say she probably deserves to win it or at least be second place. I don't know who else could have a better year, but for me, she deserves to win a Ballon d'Or at some point uh, if her trajectory remains the same. Yeah, I imagine so. And <clears throat> the mastermind who put all this stuff together is Mr. Sam Hines, right? Yes. Funny enough, yeah. I saw Sam play in Richmond when he was part of Orlando City B. Oh, that's dope. Yeah. Had no idea that. he was going to, you know, <laughs> he's legendary manager now. But, um, like, he's been integral to the performance and keeping everything consistent. Mm-hmm. But how would you describe his leadership? Because that seems to be, like, the real big thing of how he took this team that was in the midst of being so underperforming and pushing them to this next level. Like, how big is his leadership? Oh, huge. I mean, they they – they don't do this without him and his leadership. Um, I think the thing with Seb has been he's he's a young coach, he was inexperienced, but you needed to find the right person who could instill the right kind of belief. And he was able to do that. How he was able to do that, I don't know. But he he also was able to be like gain the trust of the players. He was very collaborative with them as well, to be like, all right, like here's what we want to do, like here's your input, basically giving them like a stake in the team and the performance of the team and the success of the team, which I think as a young coach is really smart to do, but also with a lot of the players they were bringing in, like I said, they were really smart in who and how they recruited. They really took to that and really took it on upon themselves. And I think that's also massive leadership too, not just coming in and be like, I'm a former, you know, player. I know exactly what to do in in every single situation. Like you're going to listen to me. This is, this is the way we do things. I think the the game of soccer to me doesn't really lend itself to that sort of leadership. There's so yeah. many, it's such a fluid game that there are aspects of it that you can control, but you can't control everything. So you just need to be able to have people who are smart enough to think on their own, to react on their own. And I think that's part of what they developed throughout these couple of seasons. And when they re-signed him as coach, because he started off as an interim coach and they said, we're going to believe in him. I was like, yeah, that, that tells me a lot about, how the players are responding to him, but also what he's able to extract out of the players, which I think, as we've saw, as we've seen, was just outrageous. Yeah. And, you, I mean, you make a very good point. Like, soccer is one of the – probably the only game where the coach doesn't have any influence during the game Yeah, at all. Like, it's not like you could take a timeout and be like, all right, cool, let's 
fix this and do this. Like, no, you really got to trust those players you put out there. And it seems yep. to be working wonderfully for them. So, like, how big is does his playing background, playing for Orlando City and whatnot, um, you know, does, does it shape his coaching approach in any way? Or, like, how, is it, how has that benefited the prize? That's tough because I I didn't watch him a ton. Like I didn't I, I didn't watch him as a player. So, but yeah. I know he was a center back uh, and and a and kind of a smart defender. And I do think that part of Orlando's thing has been their defense. So, if you translate that, I think that makes some sense in terms of how he started to develop the team. That was kind of the first part. Like we need to get our defense organized and solid and set. And then we can start figuring out how we're going to attack. And then you just get the most versatile and inevitable attacker in the world in Barbara Banda. And okay, now you're a real problem, right? Like that. Now you can win every game that you play. And, but, but it started with that defensive solidity. And I kind of talked about some of the players to really highlight, like when Emily Samus first came in the league, it was kind of like, she had a great college career. um, Didn't really love the draft prospects. So went to Sweden and played until she could kind of come back and choose where she wanted to be. Um, and then she got ended up still got drafted, but I think Orlando did all the legwork to convince her that, like, yes, this is a place that you can grow, which yeah. again goes back to front mm-hmm. office stuff, player recruitment. Um, and she wasn't necessarily, you know, she's still very raw uh at that part of the season, but she's developed so much in the past couple seasons, and this season she was outrageous. I believe she won defender of the year uh in the NWSL uh <laughs> this year, so like she was excellent. So getting the right pieces, but also giving them a system and a structure that could get them that they could execute and that would be help them stay in games and then eventually just win a bunch of games, which is something they did the previous year. They stayed in a lot of games. They weren't able to win a ton of them. But this year it all turned around and especially with Barbara Banda. So you you kind of alluded to earlier, like this isn't a league where you could just, all right, we're going to put the five best players out there and just go with a trophy. Like there has to be some kind of tactic. And even though you have an amazing prayer like Marta and <clears throat> Barbara Man, you know, mm-hmm. like you have to have some tactics. So, like, how does how does Seb put this team out of the field to go out on this amazing? What was it like a twenty six game winning streak? Yeah, like, how it, it was. How about setting this team up? I think it was twenty two or twenty three games or something yeah. like that unbeaten streak, and and I think it was a seventeen game winning streak or something like that. It was it was ridiculous. Uh, they they broke records, whatever the records were, <laughs> they broke them. Um, I think what it really started with was one the confidence that they could go out and and execute, giving them the game plan that was kind of simple enough. But they were such a balanced team that they could cope with whatever they needed to cope with. So if they needed to have the ball, play the possession game, keep the ball, kind of use it defensively, and then be smart about how they progress the ball and use it. They also had a ton of midfield dribblers who, if you get the ball to them, they can cut people up in midfield and drive forward. But then they covered for one another in case possession was lost. So it was like putting all of those elements into the team to like, if we're going to attack this way, we can also cover one another. We can also, you know, fill, fill in when we need to fill in. And so I think it was a it was a combination of a number of things that they did. But I the entire season I've been calling Orlando the most balanced team in the NWSL yeah. is because they can you can go at them however you want. You can give them the ball and try to defend. And Banda, Marta, Adriana, uh, so many other players that they have, Julie Doyle, even like Ali Watt, they can do some outrageous things in attack. And good luck, right? They'll figure <laughs> it out. They'll put the ball in the back of the net. Then you can try and, you know, defend them, you know, put them put them in a mid block, try to make their life difficult to try to progress the ball through midfield. They can go up the wings. Their fullbacks have really good connections with their wide players. They also have wide players who can get in behind. Ali Watt grew a ton this off, this season. She had three assists in the playoffs. That was just in the playoffs alone. Yeah, um, awesome. And that was outrageous. So she developed a ton this season. Um, and then, of course, if you – Put, pin them back the way the spirit did uh, in the championship game. They can drop into a low block, defend the box, and make sure that no real threatening shots get to their goalkeeper. And that's what they did, and that's how they ended up winning. So basically, they just kind of looked at each game and in middle of game action, just decided, like, how is this game going? What's the best way for us to approach it? And what do we need to do to win it? And they were able to make the right decisions along with Seb Hines, you know, coaching, but also some of the players on their own 
were empowered to do that as well. So yeah, <clears throat> I, I thought just watching them all season was so fun because they could do it in a number of ways. Yeah. And so this question is kind of like a two-part question. One, what's next for Sam Hines? Like, correct me if I'm wrong, but can Orlando, do they have an international cup yet for the women in NWSL? I think yeah, I they do. They have a, a Club World Cup, which is starting at some point. Um, I've been demanding this for a long time. Uh, I don't know exactly when it starts, and I think Orlando won't be in the inaugural one because they're taking past championships to fill it out. But uh, So Gotham's going to be in it. But, yeah, um, they they will be in the CONCACAF Champions Cup and a Club World Cup because of uh, their this season. Okay, that's what I thought. I was trying to figure out if there was a Con- CONCACAF champion because I know for the yeah. longest there wasn't one. But like for Seb, what like what's next for him? Like, does he have ambitions of moving on to anything like international or the men's game? And for Orlando, like, is it gonna be easy to keep this team together? Like, can they obviously they're gonna be again is unrealistic, but <laughs> can they keep the band together and whatnot? Yeah, the the first part, can they keep the band together? Yeah, that's another part of being smart and being serious is that I think they've done a good job of secure. They they had a run of like a week and a half where they just did nothing but announce re-signings of players. So they were smart about securing the talent that they have um, and the talent that they're building for the long term. So they can definitely keep the core together. There may be some players that move on and do other things, but I think ultimately one of the things that they've been so good at is letting those players kind of know, like, we we believe in you and, like, the best place for your development is here. And when they have the kind of season they have uh, have had and they have the kind of success that they've had, it's hard to argue against that. So I think a lot of players are going to end up staying, and I think a lot of players are going to want to get into that environment too because that's another thing that success gives you. As far as Seb, I don't know. It will be sad to see him leave, especially so soon. Yeah. Um yeah, I, I think that in terms of coaching, this is the, the NWSL, as you mentioned, like a lot of international coaches are getting notarized, like coming to the NWSL. And I think the standard of coaching is growing a lot. It's been growing quite rapidly season to season over the past like two or three seasons. And I think it's only going to continue. So I think in terms of battling yourself, testing yourself against some of the best coaches, he's going to have an opportunity to do that. And I wouldn't necessarily say that they were able to, like they were able to win games and be great. But I still think as a coach, there are cert- there, there are a lot of things for Seb Hines to continue to learn, continue to develop, and certain players that you can continue to develop and, and get better. Because like I mentioned, like there are a lot of players who were rookies or young players that can still develop and – aren't done yet. So I think it would be great for him to stay. Hopefully he does. Haven't heard any rumors of him going anywhere. Um, but yeah, I, I do also am obviously he's going to be uh, coveted. I'm sure there'll be other teams, other phone calls that his agent will be fielding. But I think right now he's in such a great spot for Orlando uh, and they have built something so special there that I think leaving after like the first bits of success you, it, it'd be a little tough to like wipe the hands and be like job done. You know, I, I think there's still a lot more they can do, which sounds wild given how successful they were. Yeah. All right. That, that, that seems cool. So let's look back at the so I guess it's probably like a cool point to kind of wrap it up on because this is a league that is not only growing on the field, but also talks of expansion. So mm-hmm. how are we looking in terms of that? All right. Cause if we've heard the rumors that it's possibly a Cleveland and yeah. uh, others coming in, like, How is the league looking in terms of that? So Boston's coming in uh, as well. Have they changed the name? Is it still Boss Nation? They they said they're looking into it, basically. Uh, So I believe they're going to have to change that name because it's stupid. Uh, (laughs) So (laughs) that's going to be something they're going to have to do. And we'll see if they uh, actually do it and come out with something better, which they should. Um, So that's coming the short list of the next team is apparently Cleveland, Cincinnati, or Denver. So mm-hmm. we'll see what the nu- next team is that's supposed to be. Every time we talk to the commissioner about it, she's just like, we'll have an update in the coming weeks. Who knows when coming weeks means. So they could announce it tomorrow or they can announce it in like June. I don't know. Um, but I know that we do know another team is coming and there are a number of bids. 
Uh, I still think the league needs to get to Atlanta. Uh, that is something that definitely is overdue. Um, and so I'm hoping that that's part of expansion in the future. But I'm also cognizant of the fact that the league can't expand too much. Um, no disrespect, but I don't want the NWSL model. I don't think we need 30 teams. I don't think we need to keep going unlimited expansion with the NWSL. But I do think there are some markets that deserve teams and can support teams uh, and that well, there should be teams there. So um, they're going to continue to expand. Um, owners like money. Expansion brings money. So I think that's going to be a thing that continues for a while. So, yeah, I, I'm I'm kind of excited to see how that how aggressively that happens and also when or if anybody pumps the brakes and says, no, nah, I think actually we have enough teams in the league right now. So if I made you commissioner <laughs> and you got three cities to choose, uh -huh. I would take Atlanta. I would take away Boston. Oh, wow. and everything. I would take away Atlanta. Oh, you're taking away and Atlanta. Two. That was going to be one of my. <laughs> I know. That's, that's obvious. Of course, everyone wants Atlanta. Yeah. If I take away those three, Cleveland, Atlanta, Boston, where are you putting your next three teams of NWSL? Oh, man. On the spot with this one. That's tough. Um, You know what's really tough about it, too, is that it's really tough because there are, like, right now, I believe there are, what, three California teams? Yeah. And it's almost like you could probably even add one more because women's soccer is like so deep in California. But I don't want to make that one of my answers because I feel like that's enough. Um, I'm probably thinking like Dallas. I feel like Dallas, Dallas or Austin, maybe something like that. I don't know which you one. You only have one Texas team? Is that yeah, Houston? Houston. Right? Yeah, it's just Houston. And yeah, that team's weird. a hot ass mess. So um they need they're they're one of the teams that needs to be serious at some point. So you think San Antonio will be a good market? No, I don't okay. think so. Um, I'm I've I've no disrespect, but uh, I've been to San Antonio and <laughs> I've, I was unimpressed. Um, I think Nashville. Um, I think we could see a team in Nashville. I think that would be a really popular team. I think a lot of players also come from that kind of area, uh, yeah. and I think they would love to play there. So I'm going to go ahead and say Nashville. Um, maybe Miami. Orlando's the only Florida team. Maybe Miami. I think a yeah. Miami team would be fun. Um, it'd be hot as hell, so they'd probably have to figure out a dome or some sort of situation. Uh, land in Miami is scarce and all of that. So financially, I don't know how much sense that would make, but I think I'd kind of like to see something like that. So, Who's yeah. Who's right there at uh, Bar FC Barcelona? Um, God, what's her name? I can see her face, but her name last name starts with a P at FC Barcelona. They just follow, yeah, they can just follow yeah. that model and bring it over another great <laughs> Uh, Barcelona, hey, Barcelona player. I would love to have her in the NWSL, and I think she needs to get here just a a little bit of injection of the dog. Like there, there's there's a thing that certain <laughs> certain European players are missing from their game, and I'm like, hey, you know how good you could be if you had just a little bit of dog in you. And uh, I think the NWSL gives you a lot of that. So there's a lot of in, a, a lot of European players <laughs> I have on list that I'm like, yeah, give you a a couple seasons in the NWSL, and yeah, you'll you'll be excellent. So officially, I think the line for the NWSL should be, we got that doll for you. That, that should be it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yes, that's kind of the thing about the league. Like, that's what makes it so fun is that, like, they these it, it is not a league. <laughs> Whenever European players come over, they talk about how fast the players are, how physical the games are and all of that, and how competitive they are. So, yeah, I, I think, like, that is a massive calling card to the NWSL because it really, like, Skill wise, technique wise, and system wise, yeah, you have some teams that are head and shoulders above some of the others. But that don't mean that the other teams can't won't scrap with you because they absolutely will. And it's kind of like even if you're watching like a, right now, like this season, there are 14 teams in the league. If you were to watch a game between the 10th place team and the 12th place team, normally you'd be like, eh. But I guarantee you, those teams are one going to have superstar talents on them because yeah. there's so much talent in this league, but also. They're gonna scrap, and you're gonna see a really competitive game of soccer, no matter what, because they are like these players go hard all the time. They don't really know how to do anything else. They always going hard. So, I I love it, and it makes it really really fun to watch week in week out. 
and I get this is the last point we can kind of wrap up on, but I mean, we see the intercourse of it today on, on Blue Sky mm-hmm. of, um, you know, how a lot of Wilson journalists and whatnot are not getting the credit mm-hmm. they deserve. And I, yeah. I wholeheartedly sympathize with that. Like, what is it going to take for women's soccer to understand that, like, the growth of this game isn't just meant with dollars, but also in those independent journalists such as yourself and Ebony and Shea Butter FC and mm-hmm. others? I mean, I, I think it's going to take the people with the access to the money and resources being smarter than they've been. Um, I don't know if it's the wrong people have been in charge. I tend to think that, uh, for some, for some, in, in, in a lot of cases, but I just think that it's really easy to, so it's, it's like, it's the same media, the, the media problem in women's soccer is the medium media problem overall, where, the quickest, the most bang for your buck is to get as many impressions or likes or clicks or engagement as possible as quickly as possible. It's never how journalism works. It's not really how it works. That's not how covering a game works. That's not how media works. So what they do is they either steal a lot of funny uh, posts from other people and put pass them off as their own, and they get a player involved because players have a natural popularity. You get a name player involved, and there you go. I love hearing from the players, but the players aren't like beat reporters. They're not covering teams game to game. They're not popping up in pre-match and post-match pressers all the time. They're not telling this. They they don't have the full context to tell a story the way that a writer does, a a journalist does covering a team. That aspect of journalism feels like it's not respected anymore. And, And there's no need for it because... You just really want the eyeballs. That's the that's the the, the clamor for the attention <laughs> is what all of this the money feels like they need to have to justify the spend. That's not how it works. It's a slower thing, uh, built thing, and you and you you get more deeper, more engaged connection when you have those journalists telling those stories week in week out, following a team, tracking their progress, talking about it. Because a lot of people were surprised by Orlando Pride. But you've been listening to Shea Butter FC. If you've been listening to Diaspora United, you were not surprised. You knew this was coming. And that's kind of, to me, that's part of the whole storytelling aspect of it is being connected to the league on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis, which you can do in a broad capacity. And it's still fine to hear from players and people with podcasts say certain things. I mean, I have too many podcasts, so I'm (laughs) I'm not shitting on those at all. But I do think that there's also the other aspect of the work that is digging in and doing that week to week stuff that helps give you a fuller picture, a fuller story and deeper connections throughout the league and with the players uh, and the teams. And uh, we just don't really see that working anywhere. So it's not really going to change until somebody says, all right, um, I have the opportunity to like bring in a player and get a bunch of clicks and start a podcast or maybe I can invest in real journalism and see where that takes us in about three, four years. It's a never ending journal. Never yep. ending struggle. It is. But man, I just want to say, dude, this has been amazing. Um, you're definitely one of the most you're definitely one of the most listeners I have every in the NWSL season. Appreciate it. I that. think you were dealing with me, dealing with this teacher code. It is it is horrible. Listeners, <laughs> I just want to say thank you as well, because this sucks. Um. Yeah, kids are not the future. They they are not. <laughs> <laughs> they are not. <laughs> I, I feel bad for teachers. Like I, I was actually talking to some coworkers who are former teachers, and they're like, "When you're a teacher, you're basically sick for like seven years straight, and then eventually your body just adjusts to everything." So yeah, um, yeah. Like I, I have a super immunity to weird <laughs> stuff, man. Like like when COVID was going around, and like yeah. everyone was getting deadly sick, I was like. Oh no! I was built for this like three years ago, man. <laughs> yeah, like, I got I'm it. Fine with this. <laughs> fine with this. Oh yeah, I couldn't handle that. Uh, I, so first of all, thank you for doing what you're doing, but also, <laughs> yeah, it's tough. That's tough. Yeah, it is. It is, man. But, <laughs> um, all the listeners, I cannot give this man enough flowers. He does an amazing job for him. So make sure you go over to Diaspora United. Go support them. Go support Shape on FC. Uh, War Star Journalists, they do a, an incredible job. He does an incredible job covering their league. Just want to give you those flowers. And thank you so much for coming on this show, talking about NWSL, Orlando, expansion, and all, all the other stuff. Listeners, um, last thing, before we wrap up, make sure you like, share, and subscribe. Um, it helps the show out a lot. We are coming out 
you're back. You know, we're pulling out these podcasts. So look, I need the like shares. Okay. I know we just had a whole conversation about engagement. Engagement <laughs> this podcast. Yeah, I was gonna say until, until that changes in a mainstream level, please like, subscribe, do all the things because yeah, it does yeah. matter. <laughs> like, let me get this copy read out. <laughs> um, with that being said, y'all, we will holler y'all next episode with another amazing story of Black Sock history. Y'all be easy. Be safe and uh, take your medicine because I'm about to. <laughs> Bye.